Hello and welcome back to this channel's coverage of the tank losses of the Russo-Ukrainian War. This episode is for May 2022. We shall start, as per usual, with Ukraine. In total, during this month, Lost Armor estimates Ukraine lost 58 tanks, 5 T-80s, 7 T-72s, 45 T-64s, and 1 T-54-55. And yes, you did hear that correctly, a T-54-55, but we will get back to that particular tank later. If we take a look at the monthly breakdown by base hull, we see that the composition remains fairly stable, with about 75% being T-64s, about 15% being T-72s, and about 10% being T-80s. Of course, though, there is the outlier. Ukraine's T-80 losses are all BVs as per normal, so their modernization status remains uniform at level 0. The T-72 losses were 5 Bs and 2 B1s, which would mean that for May, all of Ukraine's T-72 losses were modernization level 0s. While this could be said to be a continuation of what could be an emerging pattern from the previous months of the proportion of level minus 1s and level 1s decreasing, I don't think that would be a particularly safe statement due to the fact that, well, we do have sample size issues as, well, per normal, but we shall have to see, of course, in future months. As for Ukraine's T-64 losses, two are unknown, 26 are BVs, 7 are BV Model 2017s, 5 are B1Ms, and 5 are an unknown BM variant. This would result from a T-64 having been identified as having Nage armor, but no further details could be distinguished. This does mean that May was the most modern month for Ukraine's T-64s, and this inconsistent use of their level 1s, if it continues, will make figuring out their depletion difficult. Now it's time for that T-54-55. In this case, it is a T-54, and it had been a monument in Mariupol. Though I think this is probably a perfect example of an outlier, because, well, a tank pulled off of a monument in an emergency situation can't really be used to establish a pattern. So now let's talk for a minute about the whole T-54-55 thing. A T-55 is basically a T-54 with NBC protection. NBC is nuclear biological chemical. This is not that it was immune to these things, but that it would be able to operate and the crew would be able to operate for longer under those conditions. One of the primary features of this was an overpressure system in which the area inside the tank would be pressurized to a higher degree than the outside air so air would blow out as opposed to leaking in. The only easily identifiable determinative feature to distinguish a T-54 from a T-55 is this mushroom-shaped housing in front of the loader's hatch, which I have circled in red on the above tank, which is a T-54. This is then absent on the T-55s, the tank on the bottom. This was removed due to the fact that with the NBC system, this housing just didn't work. There are other features which are commonly talked about as ways to identify them. The main one is the barrel shroud or the bore evacuator, depending on which term you wish to use. This is not a very good identifier because most components on these tanks are interchangeable and ultimately that does include the barrel. So any of the three barrel, if you want to say options, could be found on T-54s and T-55s, it's just a question of prevalence. This also applies to the spoke versus starfish wheel. The T-54 on the top has the older spoke styles. These were replaced with the newer nicknamed starfish wheels, which you can see on the tank on the bottom, before the T-55s started production, but they are interchangeable parts, so especially if you get organizations that, shall we say, don't have as much funding and are likely to just use whatever they can get their hands on, 
those kinds of things are not all that useful beyond simple trivia. Another issue is that there is an absolutely enormous number of upgrades and modernizations available to both the T-54 and the T-55, many of which are bringing T-54s up to the T-55 standards, and there's also a lot that have equivalent upgrades for both the 54 and the 55, further muddying the waters for specific identification. But in pretty much all cases, the T-54 and the T-55 are interchangeable. So I just refer to them as a T-54 slash 55. What is significantly more important is how to identify these from other tanks. And the way you do that is looking at the road wheels. Basically, it has five road wheels, and there is a gap between the first and the second wheel. The reason this is important is from the T-64 on, so 64, 72, and 80, and 90, they all have six road wheels. So if you see five road wheels, it has to either be a T-54, 55, or 62. Then we can identify whether or not it's a 62 by looking at the gap pattern. T-62s do not have the gap between the first and second road wheel, but have smaller gaps between wheels 3 and 4, and 4 and 5. Taking a step back to look at Ukraine's overall modernization status, similar to the T-64s because, well, they're the most common, this is the most modern month so far. But overall, the majority of the force are still level 1s, there's a decent, but a widely varied, number of level 1s, and there's a small number of minus 1s and the outlying minus 2. Moving over to the Russian totals, we have 105 tanks overall, as reported by Warspotting. There are 3 T-90s, 17 T-80s, 83 T-72s, and 12 T-64s. If we look at the base hull breakdown, we see that, once again, the numbers have stayed relatively consistent, although this is a particularly prominent month for the T-64. The norm is about 70% are T-72s, about 20% are T-80s, 5% are T-90s, and usually there's about 5% T-64s. There is potential that we are seeing a small decline in T-80s, but it is too early to say that with confidence. And I definitely don't think that that elevated rate of T-64s is going to continue. Taking a look at those T-90s, we do actually have a change from previous months. While two of the three are T-90As, one of them is a T-90M. The T-90M is significant because it is the most modern tank being fielded by the Russian military, and is what is actually being produced new. Some of its major features are generally just better sensors, but the more visually obvious ones are that it has a unique turret, specifically the turret is extended, and it has a remotely operated machine gun turret, as opposed to a manually operated one. This improves crew safety. And when I say this thing is new, I mean this thing is new. It is believed that the first unit to have actually received these was the Second Guards Motor Rifle Division, and they're believed to have received them in 2020. As I mentioned, these are new production tanks, but can also be upgraded T-90As. So Russia's T-90A fleet does have the dueling pressures of both losses and being upgraded into T-90Ms. A little bit more about that turret is recently there was a Russian channel which uploaded a video of them trying to identify a, well, thoroughly wrecked tank. During this video, they initially stated that it couldn't be a Russian tank because the turret was wrong. Then one of them suggested it could be a Leopard, but after further investigation, they decided that it was probably a T-90M. In this, they seem to be correct. And there were a lot of people that were making fun of these guys for this, which I think is more flack than they deserved. The thing is, if you don't know what you're looking for, that's not an unreasonable mistake to make. The T-90M's turret is significantly different than previous tank models in use by the Russian army and before it the Soviet army. Its main difference is that it's a much longer turret, which does mean its profile is more, if you want to say, western. To demonstrate this here, we have two nice above views of the T-72B3 with its far more standard turret profile versus the T-90M with its much larger and specifically elongated turret. 
And yeah, the overall shape does look more Western style if we compare it to, for example, the leopard there on the left, which yes, it's not a direct overhead shot, but it does give an indicator that that overall profile is a lot longer. So if we take a look at the overall modernization status of Russia's T90s, we do see the start of the appearance of the twos. This will be particularly interesting to look at over time as the ratio of T90As to T90Ms changes as the war progresses, because the A will slowly disappear. Moving on to Russia's T80s, we see that 8 are BVs, 4 are BVMs, and 5 are Us. This does mean that while the majority remain level 1s, that pattern of the level 1s decreasing does seem to be holding. But we should also bear in mind that the sample size has reduced by quite a bit compared to what it was a few months ago. On to Russia's T-72s, which, as per usual, are the most varied. There is 1 Ural, 5 As, 1 AV, 24 Bs, 9 B 1989s, 13 B3s, 14 B3 model 2016s, and 1 BA. Overall, their modernization status does seem to be quite stable. One could point out there could be a slow level 1 decline, but it's not all that large, and again, we'll have to see as time progresses whether that holds. But we can certainly say that the T-72s seem to be maintaining their modernization, better than the T-80s are. Looking at the T-64s, we see that 11 of them are BVs and one is an A. The T-64A was a fairly early production model of the type. It has no ERA, it has no ATGM, and it has no smoke launchers. The extrusion on the right side of the turret on which the ATGM site would be located, were it AB, is still present, but rather than having a site located on top of it, it has a site integrated into it, or, well, not necessarily a site, this is a rangefinder. So, can be a little bit harder to determine unless you have a good photograph of it. And as far as their modernization status, with the, what I expect is going to be an outlier, of 1, negative 1, they're all level zeros. Overall, Russia's modernization status does seem to be showing a decline in their level 1s, their percentage of minus ones seems to be fairly stable. We do see the first arrival of their level twos, and the decline in level ones is being filled by level zeros. So while the most modern elements of the Russian tank fleet do seem to be suffering attrition, the overall tank fleet is still more modern than its Ukrainian counterpart. In summary, there's not really any significant losses regarding the loss patterns just in May. Potentially the exception you could say is the arrival of the first T90M. The things that we'll have to be paying attention to as time progresses is going to be Ukraine's use of their level 1s. Currently it seems to be pretty inconsistent, which is going to make figuring out their prevalence significantly more challenging, but maybe they'll stabilize in their use pattern. The Prevalence of Russia's level 1s is also going to be an important thing to keep track of. Does that downtrend fully develop, and if so, how quickly, and at a certain point, will it level off? Then, of course, the final one is Russia's level 2s. Once they've been observed in use for a while, then we can start to look at, okay, are their numbers increasing? If so, that would indicate that production of the T90M outstrips their losses. If that is a significant difference, we'd expect to just see the prevalence of T90Ms increasing. Or we could see it increase for a while and then level off. Perhaps we see it go up and then go down and then stabilize, which could be an indicator that the T90As, which would be easier to convert than a full new build, perhaps that stockpile ran out and so the production rate dropped. It's just something that's interesting to look at and try and figure out what could be happening. Although, unfortunately, once again, we are going to run into a sample size problem, especially with this particular tank. But that will do it for today. I will hopefully see you all again next week with the next month's update. I hope you found this at least somewhat interesting or informative, 
and I'll see you all again next time. Bye-bye.